this is her open, right? So she looks nice and tender for a fish to come. Now, you gotta keep your eye on the fish, okay? So there's, she's sticking out something that looks like a fish would want to eat it, okay? Now watch, watch the fish. <laughs> this is aggressive. Okay. She's not taking chances whether she's going to get her young onto this fish or not. She snatches this fish. She can't kill it. She kills the fish. She's defeated her purpose. Right? So she has to not kill the fish. Well, look here, you see these little almost sugar grains or sand grains. These are her young coating the gills of that, of that mm -hmm. fish. See that there? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Look how effective that is. Does it hurt the fish? It, it, it is somewhat painful to the fish when it first happens. This, but the, but the, the parasite. The parasite right. is somewhat, the clamping down on the gill is somewhat oh. uncomfortable. Okay? So here she is releasing the fish. Okay. I'd be breathing hard too if I was that fish. Okay. That fish is so tired it can't even get wet. Okay. This, this film was over 15 minutes or so. The fish is so exhausted it can't get away. She's pretty tired too. You can see her moving there like she's breathing as well. She's pretty tired from this encounter also. But notice she didn't kill the fish. The fish has to be in good enough shape that it can go on so that her young can survive. Really amazing. Do solar muscles do this to me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> they don't. They don't. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> no idea. So, there are amazing things beneath the surface. You just have to look to know what's under there. There are remarkable things happening under there. I titled this Beneath the Surface, but I couldn't help talking about some of the things above the surface as well. So I have another uh, graphic here I want to show you. And this is about waterfowl. And how waterfowl use our waters in this area in particular. This is, this is an image that was taken by Nexrad radar of waterfowl traveling at night. Okay. We now have the ability to see flocks of geese and ducks flying at night because of radar. Something we could never see before. And I'm going to show you a series of images here of, of uh, waterfowl coming out of Illinois. All right. So what you see in green is basically just clutter. That's radar clutter there. But here is the Illinois River right here. This site is just known as Amaquan is a nature conservancy site. That's why it's marked here. But what I want you to see is what looks like storms coming up. Okay, these are not storms. These are waterfowl. So watch these, what look like storms, arising off of the Illinois River and then the Mississippi River to the north as well. Those are ducks. Those are ducks flying at night. Do they dissipate? That they that they stop? Are they landing? They're landing. They're landing. They're landing. Right. Okay, they're coming down. That's why that's starting to dissipate. But watch, watch this again. Okay, notice the time. If you can see this, the time mark there is 1714 Central Standard Time. So it's 515 in the evening is when these ducks are taking off. So they're taking off at dusk. Is what they're doing. Okay, they're starting to move at dusk. And all this takes place in the course of two hours. So these images are just two hours in length. This, that's phenomenal. And then going back down because they're tired. Back down for the night. About 7, 7.15 at night. They're landing in the fields or on water to rest. Where are those ducks headed? They're going to the Wabash. <coughs> they're going to the Wabash River. That's where they're going, is to the Wabash River. For years, we have been told that there are certain flyways for ducks, and that those flyways were essentially four. That there was an Atlantic flyway, a central, oh, I'm sorry, a Mississippi flyway, the central flyway, and then the Pacific flyway over here. That's baloney. 
these ducks are going all kinds of directions. They do still primarily take those flight pathways, but there is a very strong one that goes from the Mississippi, cuts across southwest Indiana, and goes to the Carolina, Carolina coast. So the Wabash plays a role in the migration of waterfowl that was not previously known. That it is a really important stopping point in southwestern Indiana, especially when the fields flood. When the Wabash gets above flood stage, or at least high enough that it floods the fields, that's when it's really hot. That's when they want to be here, because that's when they can feed. All right. There are also some things here that aren't so good. Everyone knows what that is? Okay. Silver carp, right? Uh, they are amazing in their own right, but they're terrible also. So these, this, uh, this net around these people in the boat, that's not for show, okay? That's to keep them from getting noses broken and, and things like that and cut because these things will jump out of the water. If you've been in a boat on the Wabash in certain areas, you'll see them. They jump out of the water and uh, they'll go. The fear right now is that they'll make it to the Great Lakes. They're not in the Great Lakes, but they're getting close. Uh, They'll, they'll get there. I mean, we might as well face it. They'll get there. They, they will be there sooner or later. What are they called? Silver carp. Asian carp. Asian carp, Asian carp also. Now, it came to the United States uh, in the 70s. Uh, catfish farmers brought them in to clean their catfish ponds. They're filter feeders. So they threw them in with the catfish, and they fed on the algae and the plankton in the catfish ponds. You remember the great Mississippi flood of 1993? Oh, yeah. It flooded into those catfish ponds, washed those fish out. Wow. And when they got out of those catfish ponds in Arkansas, they took off. There was nothing to stop them once they got out. So they, they are, the problem with them is, is that they are basically pulling out the bottom of the food chain. By feeding on so much plankton, they're, they're collapsing the food chain from the bottom, from the bottom. And so, all the way up, there's going to be a ripple effect all the way up for all those fish species above, above plankton feeder. I understand that they, in fact, in China, don't jump. I don't know. They don't, they, they they don't, don't jump, jump like that. Um, the Chinese who come here to see it yeah. are amazed because in China they don't jump, so something has hmm. changed. Never heard that. It's curious. They probably get shot. All right, here's some <laughs> other things that are happening out there you may not have heard of is that pharmaceuticals are showing up in our rivers and streams at increasing amounts. Um, in part, it's because people are dumping them down toilets, right, and flushing them. But most of it's because it goes in here and it comes out, okay? <laughs> Your body does not process the entire amount of the pharmaceutical that you take, okay? Some of it leaves your body and goes on. So there are lots of it that's coming out. It's coming out from other places. It's everywhere, really. It's animal. It's uh, the wastewater plants, it's, it's uh, landfills, it's septic tanks. It's coming from a thousand places is where it's coming from. But it's showing up in increasing numbers. There was a study done on the Eagle Creek watershed in Indianapolis where they looked at 54, they were looking for 54 pharmaceuticals. And by looking just in that watershed, they found 30. They found 30 of them in the water. Twelve of those were antidepressants or antibiotics. Twelve were cardiovascular drugs. Six others were anti-epileptics. Ibuprofen, acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is like the number one out there. They can find it all over the place because people take acetaminophen, right? It Everybody? could be why the carp are jumping. Hey. Mm -hmm. They're all they're all jacked up. They're jacked. Here they are. I wonder Hard if they're so But it's out there, and it's something that we need to be concerned about. Okay, we already saw this this year, right? Wabash got to be tremendously low, okay? We didn't have water this year. However, there are other years when we have a lot of water. This, I found to be a really fascinating graphic. It's a, a topographic map, really, of, of a rainfall event. This happened in the summer of 2008. If you remember, central Indiana got this gigantic rainfall in the summer of 2008. Uh, around, uh, West Central Indiana and Columbus, that right there, that's 16 inches fell in 15 days. Right there. The Columbus Hospital had water running through it in Columbus, Indiana. Okay? It was terrible, the amount of water that fell during that time. All right, where's all that water got to go? 
down the Wabash. Right? It's got to go down the Wabash. Okay. It all ends up in one place. It goes down the Wabash. But on the way, it did damage like this. I mean, that field is not usable. At least that area of the field is never going to be usable without somebody working on it, right, with a bulldozer and reshaping that field. Uh, and look, that's a, that's a sunny sky. This is not like during the, like it's raining at this moment. Uh, the weather has passed. But that much water is still flowing off the landscape. Okay, tremendous amounts of water. Now you all recall what happened at Mackey Bend, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. cut that island. Okay. Uh, and I show this to other people, they don't know where Mackey Bend is, but you all, you all know. Yeah. Okay, Posey County. Mackey Bend took the hit of all that water in conjunction with a very low Ohio River. It was a confluence of events. The Ohio was very low. The Wabash got very high. Okay? So the, two, the difference between the two is great. When that happens, it means water flows very fast. Right? The gradient is a lot, so it flows very fast. So water began flowing very fast, and it started cutting across right here. Okay? You can see a kind of a channel right there where water has flooded in the past and gotten over. Water started flooding across here, and as it got going across over the period of several days, it cut this big channel that exists now across Mackey Bend, creating this big Mackey Island, isolating about 1,700 to 1,800 acres of farmland when it did so. But what you got to note here is that it, ah, sorry, I'm getting there. Uh, right here, there's a small channel being cut right here. Okay, this is the big channel, but here's a small channel that's been breached right here. So in time, this weakness is going to be exploited by the river, and the water's going to want to come across here. And sure enough, that's what happened. This is looking at the same bend, but you're looking westward. Okay, so here's Illinois. This is the big bend in the Wabash. This was the first break right here. Here's the second break. Okay, so it created the second break, and this is now the primary path going across here. But this is fascinating that you can see what's going on is that while land has been erased, land is being created in this room. This is why rivers function. Where land disappears, land can also be created. And so here is a peninsula being created, right here. You know, here's another one right here coming out. Look at the way this is filling in, where, where the Ohio River, not the Ohio, the Wabash is filling in. Okay? This will eventually be cut off, probably right in here somewhere, right in here, and there'll be a, about a six mile long oxbow lake is eventually what will be created here. Okay? It'll be the biggest lake in Indiana other than Lake Michigan. Okay? It'll be one of the biggest lakes out there. Longest oxbow lake for sure. Very long oxbow lake. Area-wise, it won't be the biggest lake, but oxbow lake, it will be the biggest. I'm sorry. Okay. I went back and did some research myself last summer, uh, I was asked to give a presentation to the, uh, the legislative study, study panel about fresh water in Indiana. So I went back and did some research on what the greatest flood events were as measured here at New Harmony. And the 12 greatest flood events going back to 1900 look something like this. So you have this flood of 1912-ish, something like this, the 1943 flood. Uh, the 1937 flood, which was the big flood on the Ohio, shows up. <coughs> we had this big gap right here where we didn't have a major flood event really on the, on the Wabash. Then, wow, look at this. Okay. I don't know what you believe about climate change, but this is evidence for climate change. Okay. The climate is changing. Okay. And it's shown in its evidence in things like this. We have this cluster now of flood events which didn't exist for the previous 90 years. Okay. It could be a long-term pattern, but whatever the pattern is, it exists. And we don't know what's happening from here. Will this continue or will this stop? No, no, one, no one knows. Okay. Time will yet say. All right. 